Let's see. Multi-product company. Arthur? Yes. Um, when when a number is missing, uh, what do we do after that? Well, you solve for the number. That's what I showed here. So here we didn't have the fixed cost, so we go and solve for it. Okay. Yeah. Just using the basic, um, using the basic algebra. So just always try to bring it back to what you know, the formulas you know. So here, if you know y equals mx plus b, that linear equation, try to fit it back into that formula. Okay. Let's talk about sales mix and break even. So we can modify this, all these formulas we've learned about today, in order to fit into a multi-product company uh, framework. But when we do this, our definitions change. So our definitions change to from unit contribution margin to contribution margin of a composite unit, meaning like the, a unit combined with multiple different products. Um, and then a composite unit is composed of a specific number of each product from a, a sales mix. So we're gonna talk about sales mix on how do we combine these into a compo composite unit. So we're gonna try to figure out how we make multiple products into one combined unit and call that a composite unit. And then the sales mix is a ratio of volumes of various products. So we're using all the same equations. We're just taking the math, doing the math for the composite unit. So the composite unit is just our estimate based off of all of our sales mix. Um, but otherwise the formulas are all the same and relatively simple al algebraic equations. So here it's a haircut company. Our annual fixed costs are 192,000. We have three different types of haircuts. So this might be like your uh, super cuts or something, right? Selling price, we have our basic haircuts, our ultra haircuts, and our budget haircuts. Our variable cost for each of these change, changes as well, right? So our selling, maybe we're using better shampoo and conditioner or, or something like that. So we can figure out easily what our unit contribution is for each of these. We just take the selling price minus the variable cost. All kind of makes sense here. We make the most money on our ultra. We make the least money on our normal products and our budget is decently profitable as well. So then we can figure out our sales mix from here. Sales mix ratio. This is a given. The sales mix ratio tells us how many of each product offering do we sell? This will be given to you. So we're saying four out of every seven haircuts, four of them are normally a basic haircut. Two of them are normally an ultra haircut. And then one person's a cheapo and wants the budget haircut. That would probably be me. So uh, we will take that and make estimates based off of it. So our selling price per cut, what we do is we'll multiply the selling price by the sales mix ratio to get a composite cost. cut. The selling price is 20 times a four. And then that gets us our composite per unit. So a total unit is $160. We're saying seven haircuts make one unit, one composite unit of haircuts. And we'll also find our total composite variable cost. So again, we just take our variable costs by the amount of units we expect to sell in the product mix. Product mix being given to us based on data that we have available to us. And then we get our composite top, variable costs. 
sum of all of this. And then we can get our composite contribution margin. Which is just our composite selling price versus less our composite variable cost. That's our $64. Then we can calculate our break-even point based on this $64 contribution margin. It's the same formula. We just take our fixed costs, which we know we have up there, break even. Fixed costs divided by our contribution margin per composite unit. So we have to sell 3,000. Haircuts. 3,000 composite units of haircuts, right? So how many haircuts is that actually? It's the seven times the 3,000, right? A com one composite unit of haircuts are all these different haircuts. That's what we're calculating. We're just aggregating it and then figuring out we need to sell set 3,000 of these seven grouped units. Does that make sense? Questions? So maybe they bought a $200,000 or approximately $200,000 salon and they need to sell 21,000 haircuts. You can start doing math in your head, right? You can say, how many haircuts can I do in given a day in that salon? Let's say it's, you can do, you have a few hair a stylists, let's say you could do 50 a day. You have to have 420 days to break even on it. Oh, 420 working days, which is about two years. And so then the question is, do I want to enter into this business if it's going to take me two years to make back the cost of the salon? Or is there something I can do to lower my fixed costs? Maybe I rent the building instead. So on and so forth. So haircuts, that's what we're saying. The 21,000 haircuts. We can figure out the amount of haircuts by sales mix as well. So we need to do 12,000 basic haircuts, 6,000 ultra, and 3,000 budget. And then you can make an income statement based on that. That's all they're doing here. So there are some assumptions we're making here that are important, right? The assumptions are costs can be classified as variable or fixed, that we actually have that data available and that we can, we can assert that with confidence. And we know that costs don't, aren't always easy to classify or sometimes we don't have the data available. Another assumption, so something that has to be true, like an axiom, right? Something that has to be true in order for this to make sense is that the costs are linear within the relevant range. What does that mean? This concept of relevant range is important. It's just a definition term of businesses change with scale. So when we're talking about a relevant range, we're talking about what if I buy one salon? But at a certain amount of haircuts, you can't do that within one salon, right? You might need to buy a second salon. That changes the relevant range. It no longer makes our analysis relevant. Um, so we're talking when we talk about a relevant range, it has to be where the fixed cost stays stable. Because fixed costs jump at certain points, right? You need to invest in a lot more fixed costs or buildings or equipment if you want to ramp your construction. And then, then we are also making the assumption that the sales mix is known and is constant, right? That's a big assumption we're making. That trends change over time. We're looking at past data in order to make these assertions. And then all units produced are sold, which we know that's not always true as well. So there's a lot of estimates making, taken here, and we might want to adjust for them in our sensitivity analyses. So analyze changes in sales using the degree of operating leverage. So all we're doing here, degree of operating leverage, tells us how our contribution margin and net income relate. And by, by that, it tells us how many fixed assets are being used in a business. 
So degree here, degree of operating leverage. We're just saying, so I'll put this here, degree of operating leverage. Total contribution margin, we said was $36,000. And our pre-tax income is 12,000. So our degree of operating leverage here is three. We're saying for every dollar of income we make, we have $36,000 of contribution margin. Right, let's say this number went up and it was 24,000. we'd have less operating leverage, right? It means we're using less fixed assets, essentially. So we've talked about using Excel. And then we talked about the difference between absorption and variable costing. That, this is just a summary. We don't need to go into it into detail. That's gonna be the next chapter. But the concept here is the contribution margin statement is non-GAAP. It's used just for these business analyses. It's used a lot for project analysis to see if a project's going to be profitable. While the variable costing method, uh, I mean, uh, the absorption costing method is the GAAP, general accepted accounting principles method, right? Where we allocate a portion of fixed costs to the inventory. So that's it for chapter five. Are there any questions related to break-even analysis, sales mix, costing behavior? Out of all the classes or all the chapters in the book, if you're a non-accounting major, but you're still interested in business, this is probably the most useful chapter.